everybody. On behalf of Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, I welcome you all to this second talk in the series called In Conversation, which is a part of our collaborative outreach. This series called In Conversation, we are conducting in collaboration with Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee Research Foundation. And we are really grateful to them for coming up with this idea of having this series. The first talk in this series took place in November, which was liked by everybody. Now, today, the topic of discussion is Budget 2017, Remonetization, Recalibration, and Reform. The topic of the first talk was demonetization. Uh, we have a panel today which could not be better in any sense, very, very eminent panel. So we hope to have a wonderful discussion, illuminating discussion on this subject. The, the discussion will be conducted by Mr. Ashok Malik, senior columnist and author. He will be in conversation with Professor Vivek Debroy, eminent economist, well-known scholar, and member of Niti Ayog, Professor Ratin Roy, Director, National Institute of Public Finance and Policy, and Dr. Surjit Bhalla, Senior Economist, Chairman and MD of Oxus Investments, whose columns are very, very popular with everybody. So, I welcome our distinguished speakers and discussants of today, and I'm sure that we are going to have a delightful and illuminating discussion on this subject. So, welcome you all to this discussion. Uh, so now it's over to Mr. Ashok Malik to conduct the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, the format we will follow is that we have about one hour for a conversation uh, between uh, uh, our panelists and uh, in which the panelists will answer some questions I'll put to them. They could uh, choose to answer those questions. They could choose to just uh, answer each other and interject. And after that, we'll have about half an hour for questions and answers that... Uh, questions that you may pose to individual panelists or to the panel as a whole. Uh, let me begin, uh, Vivek, uh, Surjit, and Rathin, by asking you, each of you, to make opening remarks on two or three key takeaways, positive or negative, from this budget. So not general statements, but just two or three quick takeaways. Vivek, starting with you. Well, thank you, Ashok, and good evening. I think I'm actually going to make a general statement. <laughs> and the first little bit is that a union budget is only an annual statement of the union government's receipts and expenditure. It is nothing more than that. There is a great deal of hype associated with the union budget. Some of it is unwarranted. I personally think much more of attention should be devoted to state-level budgets. Budget, the union budget happens on a single day in the year. This does not, therefore, mean that the remaining 364 days the government ceases to function. Quite often in the past it has happened that wonderful policy announcements are made in the course of the budget speech. 
the chambers stand up and applaud, give the budget 9 out of 10, and subsequently nothing happens in terms of implementing those promises. I am delighted that this budget does not have any so-called big bang as expected by commentators, not these two other commentators. So far as the budget is concerned, please do understand that despite the hype, most of expenditure is given to any finance minister in the short run. It is exogenously determined in the short run. You cannot touch it in the short run. Anything between 85 to 90 percent, Rathin will have a better figure, is just, you can't touch it. So the budget essentially boils down to tinkering with the revenue side of it. And the revenue side essentially means I have some kind of projection on what the tax revenue is going to be. And given the present state of uncertainty, I'm not very sure what that revenue projection is going to be on the tax side. I have some assumption I can make on the non-tax revenue side. On the tax side, I can tinker either with the direct part or the indirect part. The indirect part, of course, is stuck in whatever is going to happen or is not going to happen to GST. The direct side is stuck on the issue of exemptions. And stated very simply, there are opportunity costs of resources so if I give exemptions to people, more exemptions to people, that is money I cannot spend on investments, including transport. That's the trade-off. And finally, I have the fiscal consolidation target. So this budget, I think, needs to be considered against the backdrop of the continuity of the, this government's policies. It is part of that scheme. It is not something that is hanging there in isolation. Yes. Uh, that is well put. And indeed, in this conversation, I hope to discuss not just the budget per se, that is the event that took place on February 1st, but the general economic conditions as we, we begin this year, which includes, of course, a great disruption called GST and so on. So, Sujit, your initial thoughts on the budget. <clears throat> yeah, first um, uh, thoughts, general thoughts on the budget. Um, look, I think there were two or three areas, important areas, that the budget addressed. Um, and I think in that regard, it was a very, very good budget in terms of the direction uh, that it outlined, which was fiscal discipline, um, increased, uh, if you will, uh, trying to get increased payment of taxes, reducing the tax compliance, tax compliance, for personal income tax, reducing the corporate tax for 96% of the firms and to 25% without any removal of deductions, and last but not least, bringing the first step towards electoral reform. Now, <clears throat> you know, why it is the case, K, we sort of are left always, even with an excellent budget, um, why did they do a couple of things? So, as somebody might say, you dil mange more, or somebody else might say, why this problem? And I'll illustrate two or three um, where there's, uh, if you will, doesn't make logical sense um, to me. Um, <clears throat> first, and I hope that in this discussion we get some answers uh, to these problems. One is the increased. Uh, authority given to tax officials, so much so that this authority goes back uh, in a very retrospective way. And, you know, our, our finance ministers, whether from the BJP or from the, or the Congress, love the, you know, 1962 Ancient Income Tax Act or whatever it is that they needed in order to get more compliance. They needed to bring in this authority um, that uh, the tax officials uh, needn't, um, you know, you can be forced to pay or appear, etc., without any um, recourse to any legal uh, or otherwise. Even, uh, even in a discussion sense, it seemed to rule it. So I, I just don't get the logic as to how 
uh, that'll help. And why was it needed? So the real political economy is, why was it needed that you needed to go back to 1960? I mean, what is it in the present taxation system um, that doesn't allow you to do that? Um, then, you know, the budget rightly talks about, and finance minister talked about it, the PM talked about it, about the need to raise tax compliance. And it really, really is very low in India. And it's personal income tax compliance, not corporate. Um, and, you know, and I've been arguing that a necessary condition for increasing tax compliance is to decrease tax rates. So, uh, and maybe even sufficient, but certainly necessary. Um, and so they decrease the tax rates for those earning uh, two and a half to five, and increase the tax rates for the people who comply the least, which is above um, 50 lakhs. Again, I have yet to find a logical explanation for it. Maybe there is one. Um, third part, you know, that w while we're on tax compliance, um, and this goes back to the first point I just made about uh, tax officials, that, you know, so the reason we are very, very poor tax compliance society is that the individuals are venal. We don't want to pay taxes. But at the same time, the tax authority, i.e. the tax administrators, are venal and corrupt. So let's just be clear. You could not have this low compliance rate without the full compliance of the tax authorities. Now, how by giving them the extra authority um, you help solve this problem, I don't know. And last, that the election funding, a very good reform, uh, and I think it's not the end of the road. I hope it's not the end of the road. But even there, there's some question marks raised, which is that while the limit has been reduced from 20,000 to 2,000, that, that you have to pay by check, anything above 2,000, it's not clear whether payments between 2,000 and 20,000 have to be declared. So I don't know. That one, I genuinely do not know. Again, um, I was at a you know, seminar, if you will, yesterday, uh, where this point was raised, that you don't have to declare. It's ambiguous or whatever, and we'll all look through the fine print. Um, but I think the first two parts are really, really, and the third part is on, on tax rates of corporates, which we'll do later. But we are a very heavily taxed economy as far as firms are concerned, and we have a very, very low tax compliance economy as far as individual taxes are concerned. Those are, so the government tried to address the second one, botched it up a little bit, and tried to address the first one, also botched that up a little bit. So I hope uh, we'll get some clarifications. Fair enough. Ratin? Well, again, <coughs> thank you to NMML and <coughs> Shyam Prasad Mukherjee Research Foundation for inviting me to what will probably be the last, hopefully the last budget uh, talk of this season for the reason we make pensions. We need to, I think, move beyond the budget as an anchor. Next week you come back and talk about Tamil Nadu politics. Tamil Nadu politics, far more interesting. Okay, so the way I look at it professionally, I'll just give you my professional take. It's, there are three things you look at. Uh, keeping in mind very much what, what Vivek said, that the budget is interesting in two ways. One, in terms of the marginal changes it makes to fiscal policy. That can happen at the macro fiscal level, the tax level, and the expenditure level. So we'll talk about that. And the second is where it reflects continuity in the policy of government. So you can actually see when you compare it with previous budgets, some elements of structural change happening in the area of fiscal policy. This year, I mean, one of the biggest achievements of this government has been in the face of opposition from within, maintaining fiscal prudence defined as continually adhering to the stated fiscal deficit GDP ratio target of the previous budget and the revenue deficit GDP ratio, which is borrowing to consume. And I'll come to that in a minute. This year I was pessimistic. 
because this year attending some of the pre-budget meetings and discussions, you know, even Bombay economists were saying government should spend more. They were using, in, I think, very misplaced way, words like expansionary and Keynesian and counter-cyclical. We can come back to that if people are interested. And I was really worried that this would mean that the government would completely abandon its commitment to coming down to 3 point, it was 3% uh, fiscal deficit GDP ratio. <clears throat> I was pleasantly surprised that the government, while it did not keep its promise, kept it to an extent which I thought would be politically infeasible. So I can live with this 32 fiscal deficit GDP ratio decrease. But more important, the government maintained its commitment to reduce borrowing for consumption, which is broadly the revenue deficit. Now, this is a serious matter. People don't know the long-term data. We have a structural crisis in the central government. In 1980-81, the ratio of borrowing to consumption to total borrowing, that's revenue deficit to fiscal deficit, if you like, don't say consumption, current borrowing, borrowing for stuff you do every year versus borrowing for like investment. The ratio of that consumption borrowing was 4%. By 1990-91, it was 13%. By 2000-2001, it, it was about 45%. Then in the good times, the Vijay Malia times, one year it came down. And then it shot up again uh, after that to 72%, which means almost two-thirds of borrowing that the central government was doing was borrowing for annual requirements. Since this government came in, that ratio has been declining. And I'm very happy to see that it continues to decline this year to 60, 59%. So on the macro fiscal front, I think full marks. One has to give some political space when 19 powerful people are arguing that you just let go of fiscal discipline. Uh, I was really worried that we would come up back to 3.5 and we would have revenue spending, but that did not happen. So that means that for the, for the third year in a row, this government has stuck to its commitments. And if it does so for one more year, then it will be the longest time any government of India has stuck to its fiscal commitments since I was born. So that is excellent. On the revenue front, the good thing is that nothing much is happening. And there are two bad things happening in terms of internal structure. Nothing much is happening in the sense that the revenue GDP ratio is slated to increase by just 0.05%. So no, sir, you are not going to be taxed more unless you, you are really upset about a 0.05% of GDP increase in, in, the, in the revenue GDP ratio. What has happened is that the, you, or if you look at the numbers, you'll see all as a percentage of GDP in terms of share of GDP, right? You will see a decline in the uh, ratio of corporate taxes. You will see excise duties declining significantly. You will see customs increasing slightly, but you will see personal income taxes increasing quite a bit. So what you're actually seeing here is, in my view, a progressive structural reform, where the finance minister is saying, in this concern, what Sujit is saying, that we need to get people who are not paying taxes to pay taxes, not to increase the tax GDP ratio, but to change its composition. Again, I think that's a very good thing. I wish I could stop there, but I can't because two very bad things have happened on tax policy. Three. See the last budget speech, if you look at it. The headline on, on part B, and I wrote about this, was reforms. I for a long time felt that, you know, if you're a third world country, then you start doing things like pan masala pe tax kam kar diya, steel rollers pe tax bada diya. This is not like serious policy making. This is, you know, this is third rate policy making. I remember I was exasperated, 2007, Chidambaram, says in his speech, uh, I am going to give concession on pet food for animal lovers. I mean, what is this? You know, you can't be taken seriously if you make these. So this government stopped doing that. Last budget speech, these kinds of, there was one silly statement, Ek to hai. normally there are 20. Something about shops remaining open till 9 o'clock. I don't know what is, that is doing in a budget. Chalo. The politics has its imperatives. But the rest of it was all reforms, and then there were five sub-packages, and you actually saw a coherent tax policy. This year, back to the same. Exemptions on this, exemption. The word reforms is absent from the table of contents of that, of that part B. And this I'm disappointed in. I share, without going into elaboration, my worries about some of the changes made to taxpayer law that are coming up. I do not like the idea that taxpayers can go and raid you and then can completely refuse to divulge the reasons for that raid to court. I understand whistleblowers and all that, but there are limits to these kinds of powers being given essentially to people who have more coercive power than anybody else in the country. I don't know how many of you know, it is easier for the income tax department to tap your phone than it is for the CBI or the IB. It is actually easier for them. 
So you have to be very careful with tax departments. They have untrammeled power and they're used to using it in rather nasty ways. So that I don't like. Finally, I don't like a small amount of repeated chori that was done. Yeah, har government karta hai. What happens is you have a finance commission. They say, okay, share the taxes between the center and the states. Then the finance bureaucrats, mainly these bureaucrats. Now what do we do? We don't have money. They impose something called a cess or a surcharge, which is not shareable with the states. Is sarkar ne bhi ki hai? Pichle sarkar ne bhi ki thi hai, to 30 saal se chala aata hai. Bipartisan. You know, gaming. This time what has happened, I feel a little sad about because it's not fair to the states. They reduced the income tax, as you were saying, rate for between 25 and 50 lakh people. Hmm? That loss will be borne proportionately by the center and the states. But to recover, when they put the surcharge at the top rate of tax, that's a surcharge. That is not shared with the states. And this I don't like. So I'm a little disappointed. I'm actually quite disappointed with the tax side. I like the progressive shift. So the, the, the hard economics is very good. But then the, the administration side and this jury I didn't like. Um, okay, expenditure side, the good news is a lot of rhetoric. But I find, this will surprise you, I don't like the fact that we are still not on medium-term expenditure frameworks, but the big reform in this budget is the end of Glad Don Plan. I think the new classification that has come is eminently sensible. It's a fantastic classification. And as we gather data on it, et cetera, it will enable us to steer expenditure policy far better than we have done for the past 40 years. So, 100 marks for this very intelligent new classification. The kale in the expenditure budget, and here maybe Vivek will know a little more than me, so I'll qualify one remark I'm making, is that there's a lot of talk. But if you're looking for boosts in spending, not much has happened. 11.75% is the nominal growth rate. So the way I look at it is, if you're spending in any one area on by more than GDP growth rate, then you're spending more in that area. Agriculture, a lot of, and you, see, you have to give finance ministers space to talk. They're politicians, they have to win elections and all that. So I say talk as much as you want, but don't do it. And he has fulfilled my wish. So agriculture, 6% increase. I can go on and on like this. Education, 7.5. Defense, 5.8. Two sectors have seen real increases. Rural development, oblique. Housing, affordable housing. And that's a good thing. That's a good pump primer. It's fast, etc. And transport. Now, transport, I'm a little confused. I'm trying to work on this. I was going to benefit later after this or from living that's wisdom on the railways. I'm not sure how much of that is due to the merging of the railway budget. But otherwise, the overall transport increase is very healthy. 20%. So overall, I like this budget. What it does is it actually, in conformity with what Vivekda said, I also agree. I think with the state budgets that are more important, we need to give them more priority. This budget actually shrinks the size mildly of central government in GDP, and that has been happening for the last three years. It does good things on revenue structure. It maintains macro fiscal prudence, and it actually targets and focuses agriculture, uh, sorry, expenditure better, notwithstanding comments on agriculture and all that. Uh, and since I'm a public economist, I like a prudent budget that is more focused. So I'm very happy. Thank you. That's extremely comprehensive and uh, opens us up to lots of questions. And uh, I'm going to ask individual questions to each of the panelists, but feel free to jump in and if you want to say something in response to somebody else's question. Let me start with Bibek, and uh, since you, in a sense, uh, work for the government and represent the government, and you have worked in the government earlier. One thing that has intrigued me is that uh, we seem to produce extremely readable economic surveys two days before the budget. This year's economic survey was extremely readable. You may or may not agree with individual chapters, but it was readable. Last year's survey was readable. Raghuram Rajan produced readable surveys. Koshik Basu produced readable surveys. But successive finance ministers and governments, irrespective of party, uh, pay lip service to the aspirations of, of the economic survey and then produce a budget which is, is more in tune with political reality today than with the aspirations of the economic survey. So what is the purpose of an economic survey? What does it, why is it there? And has it ever had any influence on immediate budgets? Well, look, the economic survey, in a way, not the way it is printed today, but some kind of report on the economy with the budget, is a constitutional requirement. In one form, the economic survey started with Jawaharlal Nehru as the prime minister, in one form. It really began to transform itself into the economic survey that we know today in the 1960s. And obviously, it sort of grew in size. 
One of the things to remember is this budget, and I will come back to your question. This budget is also happening in the midst of some institutional changes. Two of those have been mentioned, the end of the railway budget as we know it, and the new classification, which I think purely for explanatory purposes we should spend two minutes on later on. As things stand today, the economic survey, even earlier, the economic survey never had full year data. The economic survey is what? It is a statement of policy, your question was directed towards that, but it also it has data. And for many people, although the economic survey does not have any primary data, it is secondary data from within the government, for people outside it's often a primary source of data. Even earlier, the data in economic survey was typically for six months, rare cases nine months. So we had a problem. What we are moving towards increasingly, and I think it will begin to happen from this year, <coughs> is economic survey twice a year. Now what do I mean by that? One you have to have with the budget, and the second one will be in June, July, when you have full year's data and some kind of commentary on that. You asked another question about what relationship does the economic survey have in terms of policy directions with the budget that follows. I will all, only answer this question from 1991 because before 1991 for years and years nothing changed. If nothing changed, nothing changed in economic survey, nothing changed in the budget. They sort of increased in size, that is about all. I don't think it's a very easy way, there's a very easy way to answer your question because it is really a function of how closely the chief economic advisor worked or does work with the finance minister. In, a, in cases where the chief economic advisor has worked very closely with the finance minister, the economic survey has often been used as a vehicle to test the waters. To test the waters, not necessarily believing that something that is being suggested will necessarily be implemented, but at least to get a debate going. In the present case, the UBI is an example of that. With this chief economic advisor, I believe, or rather I know, that the chief economic advisor works very closely with the finance minister. So since this government came into power, certainly the economic survey and the budget have been on the same page. There will always be a difference because, as I said, the economic survey is partly a wish list. It is meant to trigger a debate not necessarily something that is meant to be implemented. Whereas if you go back to the 90s, I can think of economic surveys where economic surveys promised the moon. And, next, and two days later when the budget was presented, you seem to think that these were into parallel universes. Uh, Rathin, why don't you uh, follow up on what Vivek suggested and explain to us uh, what the implications of this new classification plan, non-plan, being merged, what, what it actually entails for the economy? Oh, very simply, you have a very good idea now on what is happening to, let me put it this way, ideally what you would need in the budget is to know what the government is spending on consumption expenditure, which means what it consumes, right? To inputs to produce outputs on a recurrent basis. So that would be salaries and maintenance expenditure. You would then need to know what the government is transferring to other entities, be they private sector individuals or state governments or local authorities, transfers. And you would need to know what the government is investing in and very importantly you would need to know whether the government when it's investing is investing in real bricks and mortar or putting money into Air India. Right? Because the two are very different kinds of investment. With the plan, non-plan classification, many of these things had become blurred. So, and in fact, for the last few years since the centrally sponsored schemes were, were, were introduced, Plan revenue expenditure was higher than plan capital expenditure and vice versa, which, is, which was an absurdity. Now in the new classification, essentially you have a very clear idea of what government's consumption spending is, what, subsid what, what is being allocated to subsidies, what is being allocated to transfers, including transfers to uh, state and local governments, and for what purpose. And 
that was there with the plan thing also, but you had to wait six months for it. How much government is doing in terms of financial investment, how much government is putting into Air India, and how much government is putting into bricks and mortar. Now, the problem, of course, is we don't have a back series for this. So making medium-term comparisons will be difficult, but that's a matter of time. I think in two or three years, we will have a reasonable back series for this. So we are now on par. We have got rid of this plan mix-up. We are now more or less on par with what you need in an emerging economy to understand in terms of the types of expenditure government undertakes and their impact. Can I just... I just wanted to confuse everyone and add a little bit to what Ratin said. But I think this confusion is necessary because even um, business journalists seem to be very confused. You're not a business journalist. <laughs> As Ratin has said, instead of plan, non-plan, we will now have, and we will now have means not just union government, state governments also, revenue, capital. But within the revenue and the capital, there are four heads separately. First head, the budgets for union government ministries and departments. So that's one clear head under both revenue and capital. Secondly, autonomous institutions, which are not the same as union government ministries and departments. Third, what used to be called central sector schemes. Central sector means 100% funded by the union government. Fourth, centrally sponsored schemes, where it is not 100% contribution by the union government, but X percent. So these are the four heads under which the revenue and the capital are now classified. Sujit, uh one of the, the, the themes all three commented on was the fiscal discipline maintained in this budget, and which has been consistent over the past four years since 2014, since uh, the NDA government, in fact, embraced a very ambitious uh, fiscal deficit figure left by Mr. Chitambaram. Uh, Ratin expressed hope that this would be maintained even next year. Next year is the final budget of this government. Uh, it is an election year budget in a sense. While neither Mr. Jaitley nor Mr. Modi are profligate or, or seem to be populist. Uh, what has four years of fiscal discipline given them in terms of political room for a final uh, budget next year? Would, would you like well, to speculate? Yeah. Let me start with just what they have said, uh, which is fiscally responsible, that they will have a 3.2% uh, fiscal deficit. I think uh, this is one of the very positive aspects about the budget. And in this case, I think they have politically uh, played it very, very well. Two reasons why they will exceed 3.2% on the downside. Um, first, the denominator, which is what's the total growth um, next year, is likely to be higher because of their underestimating. There's, mind you, this is all nominal GDP they're underestimating what total GDP would be. The second part, which is much more real, is that the tax revenues are likely to be higher because of, and we don't know that, the government doesn't know that, that's what I mentioned earlier, that they're looking at how much of the um, demonetization deposits that have come into the system represent an increased declaration in perpetuity. So in other words, the, t the tax department will figure out, listen, you deposited so much cash. And it's some frightening numbers. Huh? I mean, the simple number that sticks in my mind is that there are 148,000 accounts. And some of them might be firms. We don't know. Uh, but nevertheless, 148,000 accounts, which individually, each one deposited more than 80 lakhs, and the average deposit was 3.31 crores. Okay? So this is what the, the government has released. Now, no matter how you slice it, whether it comes in that you've got a greater amount of corporate tax, but I think most of it is greater amount of individual tax, your tax revenues are going to show a very, very good buoyancy. <clears throat> so I think they played, so I think it'll, it'll far exceed, far meaning it might very well be below 3%. 
The second is that this year's forecast of the deficit, which they had said would be maintained at 3.5 percent, is also likely to be exceeded. Um, so it'll be below 3.5. So we'll have less distance to cover because of the additional revenue. And that is because, one, the GDP growth is understated precisely because agriculture is understated. So the CSO, which is the only basis we can go on, has that the agricultural growth will be 4.1% this year. And the TC Anand was very honest, and he said, listen, I don't have data, anything beyond October, and I had a very disciplined effort. Then look, I'm forecasting on the basis of uh, whatever has happened to date, and that was on the basis that, look, Rabi, the Kharif crop we know, and that was up about four, three and a half percent in acreage. You add about 0.6 percent of extra productivity, which is also very low, given that this year was a good rainfall year uh, versus last two drought years, and you come at to the 4.1 percent. Now, what has surprised everybody, and since part of the thing was demonetization, what has surprised everybody, perhaps including the government, but certainly all the critics of demonetization, is the amount of acreage that has gone up in the rabi crop. And for some crops, it's 8 9%, and I think on average basis, it's something like 7 Now, <clears throat> if that 7%, if you will, you add about 1% for product, extra productivity, which is, again, very conservative. So what I'm trying to say is that the agricultural growth this year is very likely to be somewhere around 7 to 8%, rather than the 4%. That boosts up, if you will, the denominator. So independent of the numerator, which is how much tax revenues and whatever you're getting, or fiscal deficit, I'm not even changing that estimate. I'm just saying that this estimate is larger by about, and you will get something like 3.3% for this year. So therefore, if they're stuck with 3.2%, so they haven't achieved anything. So I think they are very, very good signs on the taxation side, which is why I want to reiterate why in the world, when you've got all this going for you, why, are you empowering your why will you do the tax rate, Raj? Uh, we'll come back to that yeah. in some time. I want an answer at the end. No, I, I an don't answer. have an answer. Yeah. I'm not prime minister yet. <laughs> uh, Rathin, uh, Sujit did refer to electoral reforms as uh, electoral finance reforms as one of uh, the themes which was tackled in this budget. Uh, there was this question of uh, election bonds where white collar folk can buy bonds, can fund a party without actually engaging with that party or its individuals. Can this work? What do you think of this idea? I, I didn't read that part of the budget because I don't believe these things should be announced in budgets. I really don't. I, 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 you could announce it when you like. But the budget, the sanctity of a budget is you don't use it for everything. So elect electoral reform is not part of a budget. No, I, I, I should have, so I, no therefore I did Satyagra, I did Dharna, I didn't read it. I mean, Sujit, <laughs> so, so yeah. could I ask you to tackle that then? Yeah, look, um, no, look, we, it is in the context of, uh, he's taking the Fifth Amendment, and, but it is in the context of demonetization that the electoral reform uh, is very, very important. Um, after all, if demonetization is going to have any effect on future, um, on where black money, on future creation of black money, then you need to cut down the use of black money, or, the, or you need to increase the opportunity cost of black money, whichever way you want to look at it. Now, and I think, you know, Generally, even the PM seems to be in full agreement with that um, hypothesis that, listen, I need to, you know, uh, and you look at the, and, you know, this is one of the reasons I really liked it. They, what are the three big sinks of black money? One is uh, tax evasion. Um, the second is property tax evasion, which is why your circle, it also has to do with the, um, Stamp duties, uh, which is a state issue. Election bonds. Yeah. So, and the third one is the election. Now, <clears throat> by 
the, and this is the first step. You know, one interesting thing which Mr. Jaitley said in an interview afterwards, um, you know, for whatever reason, whenever the NDA comes to power, which hasn't been too often, it was 98 and then uh, now, that electoral reform is one of the big things. And so it was with Bajpai. Um, and there was a whole commission set up. Indrajit Gupta was the head of that commission. And it was as part of the commission, which, whose recommendations never got accepted because they got defeated and Congress never became law and Congress uh, came into power. But it was, what Jaitley said was that there was a, a paper submitted by Manmohan Singh on the Congress party, for the Congress party, which recommended this bond. That this was a way, uh, so if you're looking for a bipartisan solution, attempt at a solution uh, towards this, it is this bond. Now there's a lot of sort of uninformed criticism on the bond uh, because the, the rule seems to be if the Modi government has done it, it's got to be wrong. Uh, but I think, you know, the fact that it is something following up on the heels of what um, as, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh had recommended back a decade ago, um, I think it's very, very sensible. That part of the reform is very sensible. And again, I want to stress, from my vantage point, whether it be on the tax reform or in this, this is not the end of the road. I think this is steps very much in the right direction. Hopefully, we will get to, in a couple of years, there's no 2,000 rupee limit, and there's no anonymous bond. But you need to take these half steps, which is a revolution, as far as electoral funding is concerned, it is a revolution, in order to complete the revolution. Vivek, uh, you and I spoke here, or rather you spoke and I interviewed you uh, a couple of months ago on demonetization. Here we're discussing a theme uh, called remonetization. Uh, the, the budget did address some of the groups and constituencies uh, on industries that had been hurt temporarily by demonetization. Do you think it did enough? Do you think more needs to be done? Do you think demonetization is now behind us? Uh, with its, with the challenges of demonetization now behind us and the economy has moved on. I'm actually not very sure what response to give to that. A lot of figures are floating around, including an economic survey this year of what the impact has been on GDP. A lot of people quote the figure that's given in economic survey, but don't bother to read the several, several caveats that are given in economic survey on estimating. I will not get into the pitfalls except to state that GDP is rather a technical term and even if economic activity suffers and declines, the impact it has on GDP, particularly if it is real GDP as opposed to nominal GDP, is not that immediately obvious. But let's assume that we don't know what the reduction has been. Let's assume we need to stimulate GDP growth. Question is, how do you go about it? Sujit mentioned the second income declaration scheme. The fact of the matter is that how much of money is going to come in under the second income declaration scheme, you do not know, and you will not know till the end of March. And out of whatever is declared, all of it does not come into the government's coffers, that is the consolidated fund, either as tax or as penalty. At most, and this is on the high side, it will be 50% of whatever the figure is. And some of this may well have been declared under the first income declaration scheme. The point I'm making is this. What do you do to stimulate? Either you say, I'm going to across the board spend on things that add to the productive potential of the economy in some sense, like transport. And Ratin asked a question. He's absolutely right that in several sectors what is promised is not through the budget, it's through other means. The sole exception, apart from the rural sector and the housing, is actually the railways. Now, depending on where, remember this year, dividends 
are no longer being given. So depending on how you define, the increase to the railways have been of the order of 20,000 crores to 25,000 crores, which is not an insignificant sum of money. It's gone up to 55,000 from 30,000 with dividends. So it's a substantial increase. So either I spend on this, or for specific sectors, I give exemptions. That's the choice. Now, the trouble with giving exemptions for specific sectors is that if I've got a goal of standardizing and harmonizing, particularly on indirect taxes, the more I give exemptions, the more difficult I make life for myself. Let's look at the counterfactual. The Revenue neutral GST rate will be determined by the GST council and there will be multiple layers. No one knows therefore what the revenue neutral, the par revenue neutral GST rate will be, but it will be at least 16% if not 18%. So the logical thing to do in anticipation of the GST would have been to hike the service sector rate. That's the logical thing to do. By not hiking the service sector rate, in effect, he has done precisely what you are suggesting. By not hiking that, it would have been very easy to remove all the cesses and the surcharges, but the price for that would have been a hike in the service sector rate to, I don't know, 15% plus. That is what he has resisted. So what has happened is a bit of a balancing act. On one side, increase expenditure on transport and the rural sector and much of this actually follows what the Prime Minister had virtually announced on 31st of December. And secondly, you are careful about not hiking rates and that is one reason you do not have the expected reform on the indirect tax side because reform on the indirect tax side would have meant a hike in the service sector rate, a change in the threshold and a reduction on the manufactured side to converge to the GST. What happens when GST comes as this big disruptor in the middle of the financial year? Do you expect the uh, government to look at these numbers again? Do you expect... I think, I think Ashok, uh, a lot of people are using the expression GST. And when we are using the expression GST, Ratir actually is better poised to answer this question. When we are using the expression GST, we have an ideal GST in mind, where all indirect taxes are subsumed in a single rate and there are no exemptions for anyone. Clearly, we have no consensus on that, which includes the political consensus, so we are not going to get there. So one way to look at it is we sit around and debate for 10 years more until we get that consensus, or alternatively, we go ahead with what we know is a second, back, second best solution and we gradually hope to tweak it and improve it over a period of time. In other words, it's a process. So we know that certain items will be out of the GST, petroleum and related products will be out, liquor will be out, tobacco will be out. It's not even very obvious to me that some of the, um, uh, uh, some of the absolute rates, so to speak, will be converted into ad valorem, but leave that aside. And we are going to have four bands, at least. If we have four bands, I don't think major changes will have to be done in terms of the revenue projections, because that's really what you're getting at. Would you agree with the... Yeah, completely. I, uh, also, you see, there is a political game. Let me give you one example. There's all this talk about compensation. I'm of the view that the compensation that will accrue to many of the producer states will not be as high as they have been grandstanding. Let me give you an example. GST is basically a tax on consumption, and their argument is that if you remove producer taxes, we lose. The total consumption of Madurai, Coimbatore, it's a good day to talk about Tamil Nadu, <coughs> Madurai, Coimbatore, Trichy, and Chennai is greater than that of the state of Bihar. The only state where I found that consumption was somewhat low compared to what I would expect for this level of GSTP was the state of Gujarat, which we'll definitely use. But that's only one state. So I think that when, you, when, when the GST actually comes in, the, and, and the other thing is, you know, people are very worried about rollout and this and that. Now, there, there are two items. The private sector has been lazy. They have known GST is coming. 
they have not invested in it. Now I have that, you know, that you can't fault the government for. On the paradoxically, I know this from the inside because I've been working with these states, because the GST has been so far delayed, we're actually quite far ahead in our training for trainers, in our training GST administrators, in getting the hardware in, etc. So I don't Building think GST is going to create so much of a shock. Yeah. Uh, my question to you, Sujit, is uh, uh, one of the problems we've seen in the economy over the past two or three years, before this government as well, to be fair, is uh, the problem of demand. Uh, this government has sought to fight it by uh, increasing, by, by fiscal discipline and by increasing public outlays in uh, infrastructure, especially housing and transport, which has been the thrust area this year. Uh, are you reasonably happy with what's been done? Uh, of course, it boils down to implementation. What have we seen in the past two years? What remains to be done? Do you think this is good enough? No, I, first of all, I don't necessarily um, agree with, look, okay, let me start. Our economy is definitely growing lower than our potential. So in that sense, but I object to the word demand. Um, so we want to get our growth rate higher. Okay? And the government wants to get its growth rate higher, everybody else. So I think there's precious little time devoted or thought devoted in the government and outside of government as to why is it that a potential GDP growth rate is lower than it, uh, potential is higher than it is. And I'm talking not about 10 basis points or something, I'm talking about one and a half to two percent. So we should be growing and at about eight and a half, nine, and we're growing at seven. I think there are two reasons why, our, and this gets to your demand side, why our growth rate is lower than it is. The first is that our interest rates, our real interest rates, have historically been very high. And there is a time period when you do want to bring the interest rates down um, because you want to keep interest rates up because of high inflation. I think one of the big successes of this government is that it has tackled that problem head on and that inflation rate now is in a very, very subdued level. Uh, by subdued level, I mean somewhere between 3 to 5 percent. And um, <clears throat> so I think that's one uh, area where demand has been lacking um, and the NPAs is, if you will, related to, to this as well as to uh, crony capitalism in the past. And I think we need to, the government needs to now say, listen, jo ho gaya, ho gaya, and try and solve this problem and move forward. The other not recognized problem of demand and therefore of investment from the corporate sector is a very, very high rates of taxation, of corporate taxation. Let me just give you, and you know, study after study, uh, academic study, if you now look at what is the effective corporate tax rate in India, that is to say, you take care of all your exemptions and you pay a certain tax. And I'm excluding the nice little, nice in quotes, gimmick that the government has of surcharges and this and that. Uh, whatever. So just take 30% as, um, as your tax rate. And the Indian firm pays on average 25%. 5% is how much they claim on exemptions and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, so I'm looking at the effective. You can have my rate as 40% and a lot of exemptions and still come to 25. So I think what your rate is not so important, what the effective rate is. Our effective corporate tax rate is amongst the highest in the world and has been throughout. Second, so that is one set of study which showed document that our effective corporate tax rates are amongst the highest in the world, and this includes developed countries, developing countries, sub mill market. The second, you know, this government came in with great fanfare <clears throat> that we are going to improve the ease of doing business. And indeed, they have improved in a number of areas, but they were also shocked when they found out that for the last two years, our rank has stayed at 131, we moved to 130. Now, why is that? Our effective 
tax rates now, including social security contributions, dividend tax, all the rest, all the payments that a firm makes in India is at 60.6%, which again is amongst the top five or 10 in the world. Uh, so what is important here is not the level, but what is, is it that our competitors face? Everybody has various political compulsions. They have rates here, less rates there, etc. So our competitors, i.e. Bangladesh, if you want to know why we're losing out on textiles, you know, people talk about the exchange rate, this, that, and I think that's part of our problem. We don't look at the data. Um, the big problem is Bangladesh faces a 35% tax rate. Indonesia is 33%. Um, Pakistan is 37%. And you name it, across the board, our competitors are facing a much lower tax rate. So that is the reason our potential GDP growth rate is, is low. That is a reason of lack of demand. And if you will, that's part of the reason for the creation of NPAs at the size that they are. You answered a 10-year question rather than a one-budget question. But I saw Rathin first nod, then shake his head, then hold his head. Well, you did in the last two minutes. Okay. So you, would you want to respond to the same question? Yeah, I mean, I want to make a response. On what Surjit's point, I'll say, okay, if our tax rates are high, it's very clear that we're lowering tax rates, so it's okay. We're in the right direction. Uh, so it's fine. I mean, we can dispute 61, 51, but broadly speaking... 61, 35. 61, 35, we are coming, it's coming down. Tax rates are coming down. Any new company today that started, which doesn't want exemptions, can pay taxes at 25% and go home. No, That's great. Sorry, I, I just want yeah. to... To intervene over here. Sorry to interrupt. I know this is your bugbear, but I'm so, trying to no, no, leave it to No, no, no. The reason why, and, and again, I want yeah. to stress, let's just be honest and discuss what he said very rightly. A new firm comes in and pays 25%. Okay? Now, the point is that 25%, and if it gets, if you will, 3% or so of exemptions, its effective tax rate is 22%. It is still very high compared to your competitors. Right. Always, you know, we now, we no longer in a little sort of uh, world of our own. We live in a very globalized, ultra-competitive world. That's where growth is going to come from. So we don't take pleasure or recourse to absolute numbers. Oh, you were paying 30 before, now you're paying but 25, see, so you're yeah, better. Okay, fair enough, but I just want to point out without getting into this, I agree with you, but in, in an economy like Pakistan where the army pays no taxes, it's kind of difficult to compete. Listen, listen. Or Bangladesh, Bangladesh, where nobody pays taxes. Uh, so, come yeah. on. Philippines, anyway, so Indonesia, get back to your point, Malaysia. On, get back to your point, I know, I'm not engaging, now. I know this is your bugbear. Uh, the uh, consumption point, you see, there is a very important point, it comes from something Vivek said. If you think that there is an aggregate demand deficiency in this country, you don't invest in infrastructure. If there's consumption deficiency, invest in consumption. Which would mean what? Very uncomfortable things. It would mean increasing salaries of government servants. It would mean universal basic income, perhaps. So there, I think, I'm in agreement. I think what the government has not done is taken for granted this very loose argument, saying Keynesian, expansionary consumption, and said, no, that's not, that's not the entire story. There may be pockets where consumption stress is there. And there may be some guys who are making like mid-sized cars who don't like the idea that there's not enough black money now to buy more mid-sized cars. But the problem in our country is the lack, ease, uh, lack of ease of doing business, which has a lot to do with infrastructure, transport, connectivity, etc. So I think uh, in that sense, I am extremely pleased, I'm, I'm absolutely shocked actually, that the finance minister has managed to resist the popular cry of Bombay saying, basically, what have Bombay been asking for? They're saying, Mummy, I've created all these, you know, bad companies, now I'll bail out karo by subsidizing my market. Without giving me, well, uh, having me take a haircut. Yes, without me taking a haircut. And he has, I, I, I didn't think he would be able to resist it. I'm absolutely thrilled that he has resisted that. And for that, in reward, if you think, uh, Sujit thinks we should dramatically reduce taxes to the maximum extent possible, then let's do it. But also, as I said, he is reducing the share of corporate taxes yeah. in the total tax structure, and the more you're right about an increase in personal taxes, the more room there will be to reduce corporate taxes. So I think the, the, the ducks are in a row, and they continue to be in a row, and he's taking the shots to the right. Now direction. that actually, just to support uh, what Ratin is saying, what the government has said, is that if there is extra revenue from, from whatever sources, whether corporate or personal, 
that they will bring down uh, the corporate tax rate 25 percent to everybody. My final, sure I my don't completely final question for Vivek before we go to the audience. Uh, you work with the states in Niti Aayog. You work with the central government and you work with the states as well. Has this government's fresh thinking on fiscal discipline, on consistency in fiscal discipline, on uh, fresh categorization, institutional changes, has this percolated down? Uh, we've seen some of it in this budget. We've seen it overall over the past three years. Has it percolated down to the states and the way the states are thinking? It's a little bit difficult to generalize that because states vary enormously. And we are talking about two major institutional changes here. One is the funds that have gone to the states courtesy the 14th Finance Commission. That has been digested. The second one is the restructured scheme of centrally, restructured centrally sponsored schemes basket and the realignment, therefore, of state priorities and state level schemes to reflect both of these changes. That has not yet happened. It will begin to happen this year. And the third institutional one, which most states are trying to get their grips on is this new definition of revenue versus capital. Because after all, you've got a system that has been built up over the years, and you're not just talking about what um, the planning and finance department is going to do, but all the way down. So this will take some time. From whatever preliminary evidence one has got, it shows this, that out of that, enhanced 10% that has come from the Finance Commission untied, most states are spending it on, within quote, social sectors. So we should be very happy, except that the critical element is what is the composition of that expenditure in social sectors. There are states, I'm not going to name them, which have enhanced the salaries and wages of, uh, let's say, health or education sector employees. That is not necessarily the most efficient use of, that, of, the, of those funds. But the last point is what's also important is uh, state level finance commissions and the extent to which the recommendations of the state level finance commissions are mandatory because they also influence how, what states are going to do with this extra 10% and the extent to which fiscal devolution happens within the states. To the best of my knowledge, Rajasthan is probably the only one which has set up a fresh state finance commission after the 14th finance commission. Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu. The others are continuing in the earlier finance commission. Yeah, now, please. Please. Tamil Nadu has to come back to the conversation. <laughs> okay. To thank uh, all three of uh, my panelists, uh, Dr. Rathin Roy, Dr. Sujit Balla, Dr. Vivek Dev Roy. I'd like to thank the Nehru Memorial uh, Museum and Library and Shamprasad Mukherjee Foundation for uh, this series in conversation. This is the second time I've been here. I'd be glad to be back. And so I think with many of my panel, all my panelists. Uh, I'd now like to hand you over to uh, the director of the Shamprasad Mukherjee Foundation, Anirban Ganguly, for concluding remarks. Thank you, uh, Ashokda. Uh, I think. Uh, the fundamental work of a think tank is to analyze and explain policy and generate ideas. Uh, I think that has been eminently done this evening uh, in our second In Conversation series. And uh, I'm sure you'll all agree with me that there couldn't have been a better panel than this. So I think we should. <laughs> So to start with, I would like to thank guide, mentor, polyglot, and polymath, Professor Bibek Debroy, uh, Dr. Sujit Bhalla, for agreeing to so kindly accept the invitation and at such short notice come here. And of course, Professor Ruthin Roy, uh, whom I have heard before, and uh, as I have always told him, it's sheer delight to get that uh, perspective which comes from someone who's actually immersed into 
the subject. And of course, the central pillar of the In Conversation series, our very own Ashok Malik. And uh, actually, I look forward to every In Conversation series because uh, it gives us uh, a tremendous occasion to uh, brainstorm. My friend Amit Malviya also has come in. It gives us a tremendous occasion to brainstorm over a Niti lunch. And uh, so I look forward to the next in series. I thank all of you, and, and last but not the least, uh, all of you who have joined us here and uh, who have really made this exercise meaningful. We have recorded the entire proceedings, and we look forward to uh, hosting it on our social media sites and the website. Thank you so much.